Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. I've got my friend Chuck here and uh, I interviewed Chuck on my channel. It was over a year ago, wasn't it? Uh, I think it was either last, it was last May or June. One yeah, or the other. so it was a while ago and um, you got a fascinating job. You're a, you're a professional bounty hunter, um, but you've got, got a fiance here, right? Right, she and lives in Dipalog. She lives in Dipalog and so your plan is to get her to come to America on the fiance visa. Yeah, and we're about 10 months into the process. 10 months in the process. You said, how long do you think it'll be until it's done? Uh, probably another year. Another year. And then she's going to move to America. And uh, you've already got a son there, right, from a previous relationship. Yeah, yeah. That's the only reason you can't just come over here now. That's the reason why I don't move over here permanently. Right. Yeah. Um, now, do you think that you'll ever, um, sometime in the future, you and your wife would move, move over here and live in the Philippines? That, that's the plan. What is the yeah, plan? Yeah, okay. I've been trying to figure out how to make that work. Uh, and like I said, it more has to do with my son, making sure that it's someplace that's good for him also, mm -hmm. um, where he has opportunities. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'd like to live over here right now permanently. Uh, mm. You know, um, logistically I could do it, but like I said, my son really needs me back home, so that's yeah, where of course. my home base is. Mm. Um, and so, uh, in America, I haven't been there in four years, so you live in Tennessee, which is a beautiful part of the country. and. Um, you were talking earlier about inflation. Is it? It's not that bad there. Is it getting worse, or is it affecting you? Well, I mean, if you watch the news and the, you know, the news reports, supposedly it's getting better. But you go to the supermarket, it's a different story. Hmm. You know, the groceries. A lot of you know, a lot of things you buy at the grocery store have gone up by a third, sometimes twice as much. I mean, it's hmm. it really the prices have really gotten out of hand. Hmm. And um, we were talking earlier about health insurance because over here. A lot of the guys self-insure, and once you're over like you know, in your mid-60s, it's really hard to get insurance over here. So most guys just have a credit card that they use, you know, in reserve in case something should happen, or they go back to their home country. But you were saying you're paying how much a month? Uh, it's over six hundred dollars a month for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Uh, for and the you're policy. a young, healthy guy too. You know, that's yep. that's really high. Yeah, and uh, they don't cover anything up. And I have to pay the first nine thousand expenses out of pocket before they even pay anything. Gee. Now, so what if you were still married and had your wife and son with you? What would, how much more would it be then? Uh, I didn't look into it, but I imagine I'd probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple thousand a month. A couple thousand? Yeah. That's more than people's mortgages. Yeah. It's, uh, health insurance is really, really expensive. And so the whole Obamacare thing, you know, that was supposed to change everything and make health insurance affordable for everybody. That never happened, then, huh? Yeah. I mean, I think there's some people that might hit that sweet spot of income. Uh, where it works for them, but if you make too much or if you make too little, it doesn't really fit very well. You know, with me, my income's too high to really qualify for any of the subsidies, so mm. um, I don't get any help from that. And uh, I know I know people that their income is too low. They don't, you know, they're working part time or something like that, and their income is too low to qualify for Obamacare. Hmm. Now what a mess! What a mess! Um, and also, we were talking about the reason that there's not as many expats here now as there was before COVID because there used to be you know, lots and lots of guys here. You go to immigration, wait hours to renew your visa because there's so many people in line. And now you go down there, there's nobody. And uh, I paid $600 to come here. You said you paid 2500 This your... last flight was 2500 Yeah, that Man. was the cheapest I could find. And I spent God, some time looking into it. That's expensive. Wow, that's expensive. Hmm. I think that's a reason why the people are just not coming here anymore. It's just too expensive. They're going to maybe Mexico or Colombia or wherever, but they're not coming here. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's worth it. I've been to Mexico. I've been to Colombia. Um, there's a lot of good things about both of those places, but, you know, for, for me personally, not, neither compares to the Philippines. Yeah. Well, plus you're engaged to a Filipina, too. Correct, yeah. Now, where did you meet your uh, fiancé? Uh, we met online. Yeah, yeah, initially, and then we ended up uh, exchanging Facebook information. So I sent her a friend request on Facebook, uh, and eventually she, you know, I don't remember how long it took, but a little while she took her to accept my friend request. Mm. <laughs> so I started talking to her, and we just went from there. Yeah, that's same word with us, too. is like uh, we met on a dating site and then Facebook. And I think it's a good thing for, gosh, you meet someone online, if you, they have a Facebook, and you go on there and there's pictures of them with their family and their right. mother and their father and you know you've got a real girl it's not a scammer and uh some of these girls will just have you know a, a, a facebook page that has them with you know some nice pictures of their food and, and dress nice but nothing really personal like with their family and stuff and that's that's what kind of a red flag or they'll say oh i don't have a facebook it got said it got hacked or 
I don't use Facebook, and that's also a warning sign. But yeah, that's definitely a red flag, and it's nice to be able to see that. But there's even some, you know, uh, where the family's in on the scam. Wow. <laughs> so it yeah. doesn't really matter. Wow. In trouble then. <laughs> so um, have you met your wife's family and everything? Yeah, yeah, really great people. Um, I mm. met them a year ago uh, when I first met her. We, we, we first met in person in February of 2022. Mm right when the travel restrictions were lifted. Hmm. And we went to Cebu and we were there together for a while. And then her family came over and stayed with us. We had an Airbnb, um, uh, a nice uh, condo there. I think it was hmm. three or four bedrooms. And her, fam hmm. her parents and her little brother came. Hmm. Uh, and then her sister and her sister's fiance came. He's a Romanian guy and they're actually, they've gone to Romania and gotten married. They're together there now. Oh, wow. Uh, but yeah, so I got a chance to meet her family and they were wonderful. They cooked, hmm. you know, they cooked some great food and. Uh, you know, her parents didn't really speak much English. It seemed like the older crowd of the Filipinos. Yeah, my, my wife's family didn't speak English at all. Uh, but what little they did speak was good, you know what I mean? We mm. uh, Pretty good interaction. So I felt really good about it because the family seemed like really nice people. Mm. And so um, when you finally get your wife over there, um, what's your plan? How many years do you think you'll live together in America? Before, uh, you, before you can retire and come here? Yeah, I, I'd like to do it within maybe the next five or ten years. Uh, that's kind mm -hmm. of my goal. Uh, we'll have to see how it works out, you know. Uh, I know a lot of times, you know, the Filipinos come to the States and they don't want to come back to the Philippines or they don't want to move back, that yeah. is. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so hopefully that's not the case, you know. I've talked to her and I've said, well, you know, I've come, you know, a long way for uh, a more traditional woman. So I've told her all the things about, you know, what's become of the culture in America and a lot of the women there. And uh, I said, I'm hoping that she's not going to follow suit, you know what I mean? When, just, because, just because she's in Rome, she doesn't have to do as the Romans do. Well, no, I've met a lot of guys who've uh, married Filipinas, taken them to America, lived together there for many years, then came back here, <clears throat> and they all it all worked out fine. They've had well, no problem great. at all. And then a lot of these girls have met uh, other Filipinas in America that are living there too, and they, they find a little circle of friends so they can have the same food and culture and do things together, but you know, I'm sure it'll work out. Um, also, you know, my understanding of the law is that if you live together, if you're married for 10 years and you live together in America for five years, when she's old enough, she can, she can get Social Security, you know, oh, on okay. yours, you, know, you get your Social Security, you know, so that's, that could be a little benefit for her in her later years. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good now, do you think Are you planning on her getting an American passport too, or? I think eventually, uh, I think. I think they have to be over there at, with permanent residency, I think, for five years. If, mm. I'm not 100% sure of that, so don't quote me on it, but I think that's what it is, five years before they can apply for citizenship. Mm. And she yeah. has a daughter that's three years old that's going to be coming with her. Okay. Uh, so hopefully we can do the same thing for her as well. Well, so, and you've already got a New Zealand passport too, right? Yeah, I'm a dual citizenship, U.S. New and your Zealand. son is also? He, yes, he yeah. is. Um, tell us a little bit about what it was like living in New Zealand and why you went there in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I was working in law enforcement in Pennsylvania, uh, also in cor corrections at the county jail part-time, mm. and it's a rural area, kind of a depressed area. I lived uh, in Crawford County, which is, uh, Meadville is the seat of the county. Uh, it's about an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And uh, the economy was just really depressed. The pay wasn't very good. There wasn't, mm. didn't really seem to be a whole lot of prospects, even in I worked as a state constable and uh, the pay wasn't even all that great. Mm. So I was just looking for other things to do and you know because I had the dual citizenship in New Zealand I thought well, let me go over there and try things out and uh, you know by and large I really enjoyed it. You know I, I only worked for the government over there. I worked as an inland revenue agent. Uh, it was my first job there. Um, and then I worked to, went to work for the Ministry of Social Development. Mm. Um, I was working in their youth justice facility on the South Island. Um, and then I was uh, transferred or given what they call a secondment to the national office as an investigator doing like background investigations on new hires for, you know, for the department, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, so the pay was pretty good and because of the socialized health care, I didn't have to worry about health insurance. Oh. Uh, you know, car insurance, I didn't have to worry about that too much because it's really cheap. They have the ACC program there so you don't have to worry about liability insurance. Mm. Uh, just housing and food. Uh, you know, are, are pretty expensive there in New Zealand. But it's a beautiful country, though, isn't it? Very yeah, clean yeah. and just, I think there's more sheep than people over there. Yep, that's true. And they have, like, sheep shearing contests. Yeah, they have, like, yeah they have, it's really big over there. Uh, the culture, though, even back then, we're talking around, you know, 2007, 2008, 2010, et cetera, uh, the political correctness was just really extreme, even mm. back then. 
kind of you know, kind of like the way it is in America now. America wasn't so much back then, but a lot of people think that the woke is only here in America, not that it's you know in other countries, and that's not true. Huh? New Zealand had them beaten wokeness early on. Uh, I don't know if it's worse there now because I haven't been back in quite a while, but yeah, yeah, the political correctness is a, is very extreme there in New Zealand. So if you're the least bit conservative, especially being an American, you know, they automatically kind of look at you. Uh, is you know politically incorrect just because you're an American when you're over there. Hmm. Now, once again, how is it that you ended up with uh, New Zealand citizenship? It's uh, through citizenship by descent because hmm. I was adopted by my grandparents, so I was one generation closer. I was able to apply for it. Hmm. Okay. Um, now let's talk. Go back and talk a little bit about your job because you're the, you're the president of the what is it again? Now? Uh, the National Association of Fugitive Recovery Agents, which is uh, for the bail bond fugitive recovery industry in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then we have an international arm, the International Bounty Hunter Union, uh, which mm -hmm. I serve as president of both. It's all under the umbrella of the mm -hmm. same organization. So most of the guys you're looking for are in America. Yeah, most of them are bail bond fugitives. Uh, the international ones are the ones that are on. You know, we work off the Rewards for Justice program. And, you know, those are people with war crimes, terrorism, that sort of thing. They have the higher dollar rewards. Hmm. Um, but you also have to invest quite a bit of time and effort and even money into the case, you know, because you've got to hire people to do work for you and do surveillance and things. Hmm. Um, and it, it takes a while for that to pay off. What's the biggest bounty you've ever had of some of you captured? Well, uh, we had Felician Kabuga, who was wanted uh, as part of the Rwanda genocide. And, uh, you know, we, I ran that operation and we tr tracked him down in France and the gendarmerie, which is the French police, are the ones that actually made the arrest. Mm. Uh, the reward was up to five million, but we didn't get five million. Mm. <laughs> the, the up to is the important yeah. part, yeah. But we did pretty well on that and, uh, you know, I, in fact, it, it was, uh, this was back in May of 2020, mm. you know. Um, right after the stock market crashed with the COVID and everything else, so uh, when we got paid, you know, it was like the exact right time to have a lump sum of money because stocks were really yeah, cheap. Yeah. So, you know, even though the, the pay wasn't nearly what, as much as we had hoped for, uh, I was able to put that money into the stock market. It did pretty well with it. Hmm. If, um, let's say you find a guy, you know where he is, and you contact this, whoever it is that's going to pay you the money, is there any negotiation? Say, well, you know, I know where this guy is. How much money are we going to get? Like Not so in the Rewards for Justice program, no. Right. You have to make your application for the reward. Yeah. And it's actually the Secre Secretary of State, which was Mike Pompeo at the time. He was the oh. one that actually made the decision as to how much would be paid out. And oh. There's no going back and forth. You put the application for the reward in, and they decide how much they're going to give you, and that's it. Hmm. Okay. Um, who are you looking for now? Anybody big? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've got... A, you know, several people that are on our radar, you know, there's an operation that I've been running in Somalia. Uh, as, as When I say I'm running it, I'm paying for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not actually over there running it. Uh, but I have people working for me. I have a team over there. We're looking for a, a guy by the name of Jihad Mustafa. He's actually an American citizen. Really? Uh, yep, yep. So he's actually involved with Al-Shabaab, the terrorist organization that's yeah, affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Um, and he likes to build bombs and plant bombs, you know, on, uh, you know, American... Uh, you know, military uh, bases and, you know, vehicles, you know, IEDs, that sort of thing. He's a bomb maker. So, uh, yeah, the reward's up to $7 million for him. And, uh, you know, there's nothing confidential about it because we've actually made it quite well known that we're yeah. looking for this guy because we want someone that's interested in, you know, capitalizing on it that wants to get paid to give us the information. So, oh, so you'll, pay, you'll pay bribes to get information? Yeah, people? well, b rewards. Rewards, yeah, <laughs> rewards. Bribes. Yeah, rewards. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, we'll pay money for information. And, uh, you know, some of my guys on the team over there, they find other avenues to make money as well. Hmm. Uh, you know, we've had some other operations that really didn't have anything to do with, you know, fugitives. That we've I heard something on the news, seems like just the other day, about this El Shabaab. Just recently, but I can't remember what it was. Like it popped up on CNN or something. Like something about that group. Oh yeah, they're constantly planting bombs and doing terrorist attacks all over Somalia. Hmm. You know, they they're trying to overthrow the government. They've been trying to overthrow the government ever since the government started over there. Wow. Hmm. Um, and so, how long are you going to be here in the Philippines? I'm only going to be here for another five days, the 15th. Wow. Yeah, I was supposed to be here longer. Uh, well, I was supposed to get here earlier, and two of my flights got canceled you know it was canceled rescheduled and then that was philippine airlines canceled because of a maintenance issue mm. and then that was scheduled for the next day and then american airlines canceled my connecting flight because of an ice storm and then finally on the third day after i was supposed to leave they rebooked me on a flight out of jfk 
uh, which was 17 hours wow. to Manila. And so how often uh, in a year do you get to see your fiance? Uh, I've been coming just about every few months. That's so I was nice. here in February, uh, last February 2022, then I came back in May. Yeah. Um, and then it was about six months. I came back in November mm -hmm. uh, to Cebu, and then you know I came back obviously in February here to do Maggetti. That's gonna be nice when she's with you full time, huh? Yeah, yeah, that'll be that'll be fantastic. You know, it's uh, the traveling. I mean, as you, everybody that's over here has made the trip, so you yeah. know, it's it's a, it's a very long, tedious trip. Especially if you're a big guy, you know, you're flying coach. Oh, hmm. I was so fortunate the last flight, you know, the 17-hour flight from JFK to Manila that there was no, there was an empty seat next to me. Hmm. Because when I've got, especially if I'm in the middle seat, which has happened oh, before, yeah, I've had that. my elbows and my shoulders are in my neighbor's seat. Yeah, yeah, you're you touching know? the other person. <laughs> hmm. And I've got nowhere. You want to move around or something like that. It's like you've got this little space in front of you. And I almost dread when they pass the food out because I'm like, oh my god, I can't even move without, you know, I have to yeah. spill something. Hmm. Um, a couple of questions I've been asking all my new uh, guests on the show. Um, in your lifetime, what's like the hardest thing you've had to overcome or hardest challenge you ever had or something that was a real, really difficult time in your life but somehow you got through it? Ooh. Well, uh, probably more than one thing. <laughs> yeah. Just have to try so, to think of. What do you think that stands out? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, going through a divorce is pretty tough. Yeah. You know, that's a pretty life-changing event. Uh, yeah. You know, it took some adjustment. I was married for 16 years. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, I was married for 16 years, and uh, you sort of get set in your ways. You know what I mean? It, when you're, uh, even if you're in a rut and you're not happy, you're just sort of still in that routine. And you, mm -hmm. you know, your way of life. So, um, and then I had full custody of my son after the divorce. So, um, I had to do 100% of the parenting for the most part. And, wow. Uh, yeah, so that was a real adjustment, you know, uh, and it was a bit difficult in balancing work and, you know, taking care of my son and taking care of the house and all that sort of thing. Hmm. You got through all that. Um, and so, and the other question is, in your life, what's like an amazing thing that's happened to you where a good thing that's changed your life and you think that that was one of the best things that ever happened to me? And let's not include like meeting your fiance, because a lot of guys they say, well, you're meeting my wife being a fiance or my, my son being born. You know, something besides that, like career or just a life-changing event. And maybe even at the time, you didn't realize what a great thing it was, but it turned out to be like a wonderful turning point in your life. Yeah, I would say that would have had to have been my move to New Zealand. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that was like a big life-changing event for me also. And like I said, I mean, even, you know, despite the political correctness and all that mm. nonsense, uh, I really, it was uh, just a huge... Uh, you know, motivator for me, you know, because mm. we were in a brand new country and, you know, I was still a young guy at the time. I was mm. only, I think, 29 or something when we moved there. But mm. uh, it, it was just really like exploring a whole new world, you know, mm. it was like a fresh start, a whole new world. And uh, I went over there right at the, I mean, the, it was perfect timing because they had the, uh, I think they called it the brain drain or something like that because a lot of the New Zealanders, the young ones, were moving to Australia. They have mm. a, a reciprocal agreement where New Zealanders can live and work in Australia, and Australians can do the same. Mm. But New Zealand being such a small country, a small amount of people, so many more opportunities in Australia, they would leave. Wow. So they didn't have a lot of young people there. So you almost had to pick a, you know, the litter of jobs, you know, mm. like even government jobs. So I ended up getting in in the Inland Revenue Department. I was an Inland Revenue agent. Mm. And, uh, you know, we ended up getting a really nice house and... Uh, you know, it, it was it was really a, a great opportunity. I really enjoyed our, you know, my time there. Now, um, when you get married, you move to America. If you have another child, um, would it be possible for that child to have like uh, New Zealand citizenship, American citizenship, and Filipino citizenship, and get like three passports? Uh, I think if they were born in New Zealand. Um, See, the way it works, if you're a citizen by descent of New Zealand, you cannot pass your citizenship onto your children unless oh, they're born there. Okay. <laughs> My son was born in New Zealand, so that's how he got it. Uh, so any child that I had, if they were not born in New Zealand, I couldn't pass citizenship onto them. But you could go there and take them there, right? Yeah, I mean, you could take them. I could, you know, like I, you know, if I'm married again, I could, you know, to Roseanne, I could take her there to New Zealand if she can get a visa to get in, you know, so yeah, that's it's true, hard yeah. for Filipinos. If she had gave birth there, then yeah, I could get citizenship in New Zealand for the baby. I know a lot of guys that are Australian that haven't had too much trouble taking their wives or girlfriends to Australia, so I'd imagine that New Zealand's kind of similar 
as far as the laws and stuff for, for immigration. I'd have no, to aren't, look aren't into they it. Very, aren't they pro-immigration there? Like, I know Australia is where they want people to come there and retire and work and because um, of the population small. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure um, how that goes. I mean, I know when I sponsored my ex-wife for her permanent residency, mm -hmm. it wasn't really that difficult to do it. But I, I do recall somewhere in the paperwork where it said you can only do it once. Oh. So I may not be able to do it a second time. I'd have to double check on that and make sure that I understood it correctly. But mm. I, I seem to think that he, he, I can't sponsor anybody else. Now, your grandparents still alive? No, no, they passed away years ago. Okay, years so you have no years. relatives over in New Zealand now? No. No? no. So you don't, um, you don't see yourself ever going back there? Or? At this point in time, I don't have any plans on doing that. Uh, I, I, who, who knows? Anything could change. Mm -hmm. you know, anything can change. And, you know, I think I told you I left my government job. You know, I, uh, there were some issues at the youth justice prison that I brought to the attention of the media. And mm -hmm. the government wasn't happy with me about that at the time. So who knows? They may have something in store for me next time I come there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, anyway, you know, thank you so much for sharing some more of your story. And I'll be putting a link to the first video that we did with Chuck. And he talk, goes into depth about his uh, bounty hunting days. and really interesting stories there so it's so nice to see you again and thank you for coming and uh we'll see everybody next time thanks for watching Great. thanks for subscribing thanks for having me